Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. So today's speaker is Raël T. Dires. Uh, she is a doctoral researcher in linguistics at the Department of Languages at the University of Helsinki. Her main area of interest includes languages spoken in the Horn of Africa. Her current research aims at the morphological and typological analysis of grammatical number in Cushitic, an Afroasiatic language family. Specifically, she's looking at singulatives, so derived noun forms denoting one individual or one unit in their grammatical number systems in several Cushitic languages. She is currently a visiting scholar at Lacan in Paris as an awardee of the Labax EFL scholarship in the period of September to December of 2022. Please join me in welcoming Rael as she gives her talk, Singulatives in a Sample of Cushitic Languages, a Comparative Study. Rael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Today, I'm going to talk about singulatives in a sample of Cushitic languages, which is a comparative study and it's my PhD research. So I will start talking about my project. And then I will introduce the terminology that I'm using. Uh, then I'm going to uh, show you the questionnaire that I just sent out. It's published already. And the possible results that I'm expecting and then the conclusions. So my project is part of a bigger project and which aims uh, at this, like we aim to describe and compare grammatical systems with singulatives cross-linguistically. So my supervisor already started to work on Welsh and that was the first language family already like Welsh and Celtic, um, where she started to look at uh, into singulatives then this was from uh, this map is from the beginning of my first year of PhD. Um, I was meant to work on Cushitic, but as you can see here in this provisional map of the distribution of singulatives, there is at least one language per pin uh, that shows um, that singulatives are, uh, are, are widespread, way more widespread than expected in all continents, basically. So the aim of my part only is to work in a sample of Cushitic languages. And this sample includes 34 languages uh, scattered from Sudan to all the way to Tanzania. So at the top, you see North Cushitic in blue, Central Cushitic in purple uh, in Eritrea and North of Ethiopia. Then um, the East Cushitic is um, is divided into three different branches, Highland Discushitic in green, Lowland Discushitic, way more widespread than the others, Yakudule, the yellow ones, and South Cushitic in Kenya and Tanzania in the orange color. So this is not the official classification. This is a possible classification based roughly on Tosco 2000, um, which only includes the languages that I'm actually working on, all the 34 languages. But what is a singulative? So it's a morphologically derived number form denoting at least one individual or a one unit in which a marker is added to a non-unit denoting base. Let's see an example of that. So this is for the language Burji, in which we have a singulative form, Hogomancho, a one horse, which is derived from Hogomai, horses or horse, we don't know. And just to give you the entire paradigm, this is the plurative form, Hogomenna, horses. So, Going back to what my project is about, well, it's going to be an article-based dissertation. So I have divided my papers into three. The first one was about morphology is now submitted. Uh, and the second one is about semantics. So in this table, you can see on the top row, we have the form, which is what I looked 
at for the morphology paper. And the terms that I'm going to explain in a minute are base, singulative, plurative, and pocative. Whereas for the second paper, looking at the semantics of singulatives, uh, we look at the meaning. So non-number specific, which corresponds to the form, which is the base. Singular, singulative, plural, plurative, pocal, pocative. The third paper will be about other features, uh, which are beyond individuation, because individuation was the first goal that we had in mind, because we thought that singulatives would only refer to that, denote uh, individuation in terms of number. But then I realized, looking at Cushitic, that looking at the right side, uh, they also might show definiteness or some sort of specificity. Then diminutives, so evaluation, uh, both diminutives in size, endearment, and so on. Then there is some so sort of correlation between feminine gender in particular and number. Then agency, so some singulative markers make um, agents, and some sort of semantic shifts, which are not so clear yet. And so this is going to be the third paper. Let's see um, what sort of terminology that I adopted and why. So these circles are the number values that I encountered in Cushitic. So starting from the top, one or one unit. Then we have on the right, multiple units, a few units at the bottom, and on the left, non-number specific forms. And here you can see, uh, all the terms that I found in the literature, in the Cushitic literature, referring to said number values. So now let's start from the bigger group, the blue one. We have on the left, all these terms, base, basic, unmarked, transnumeral, unit, generic, general, plural, singular, collective, and mass, might refer to non-number specific nouns or markers and so on. Uh, and this is something that I, I didn't expect to find. This, is, this was not the main problem that I was expecting because I was looking at singulatives at first. So I realized that I had to find a way to determine what are these blue forms. And then from the top again, one or one unit corresponds to singular, singulative or single, usually single reference. Uh, then multiple units might be called in the literature Plurals, pluratives, multiple, multiple reference, collectives or mass nouns. And then a few units might be pocal or pocatives. So in my first study, so in my first part of the uh, PhD project, um, I refer to these number values with the highlighted terms. So for the blue one, we have base, which is the non-number specific. Then we have one or one unit singulative, because I, I was looking at the form, not the meaning. Multiple units, plurative. A few units, pocative. Let's see uh, a concrete example um, from one of the languages in my sample. This is uh, from, uh, from Gorwa, in, uh, spoken in Tanzania. And so we start looking at the first form, which is my, water which only, uh, this lexeme like, only has a base form, or at least I could find only a base form for it. Then we might have a base and also a singulative form. In this case, it's Bamiya. Uh, I'm sorry for mispronouncing all of these words. I'm sure that Andrew will correct me in, uh, later. <laughs> but Bamiya okra, as food or as a crop, so it's more generic as a, as a meaning. Uh, Bamito o, okra, as one fruit or flower. So it's more specific. And this, is the, uh, this has a singulative marker highlighted in green. Then we have a base and a plurative in which we have sanda, cloth pouch, sandalu, cloth pouches, but also a singulative plurative opposition. Laptumo a falcon, laptema falcons. And then a full uh, paradigm with base, singulative, and plurative. I, I decided not to show you a language with 
provocatives also because uh, in my sample, which was again 34 languages, only three languages show at least one example of provocative. Um, so I decided not to focus on that for now. So for this language, this is uh, the largest uh, um, paradigm we, we can find, base singulative and plurative, in which we have Fuka, Akasha, and Akainer species. Fukumo uh, and Akasha, Fuki, Akashas. Another quick example from another uh, South Cushitic language, Alagua. Um, we have base and singulative, Fara, bone, Parari, a one bone. Base and plurative, so we have Quari, ear, Quarara, Quarara, ears. And then the opposition singulative and plurative again, in which we have sihino, tooth, siheri, teeth, plurative. And the final paradigm based singulative and plurative form, yakamba, big bull, yakambimo, imo is a singulative marker, a one big bull, yakambe, big bulls. Now let's look at the questionnaire, which is what I've been working on lately. Because I was meant to do field work uh, in my PhD uh, in the southwest region of Ethiopia. It wasn't possible because of the pandemic and the war and several other reasons. So uh, my PI and I, we decided to um, work on a questionnaire instead. And it's going to be divided into two different stages. The first one will be my part and the second one will be in another project that is just starting right now. Uh, but for both stages, the aim is to look at the semantics and usage of singulatives. So my sta the stage one is my pilot study, which is out right now. It's already distributed online. Uh, and it includes 31 languages. So not all 34, because, well, two of those uh, are basically extinct. And uh, another one, it's uh, quite problematic. So we, I decided not to use those, but then plus one Afan Oromo, and I will go back to this um, later. The second stage will be to uh, use uh, an improved questionnaire based on this pilot study and also interviews. So it will be beyond my PhD, um, but it will include a smaller sample of languages, three or four. Um, it will be both online and in Finland, both a written questionnaire and individual interviews uh, with informants. Now, I looked into all the lexemes um, that I could find in my uh, data so far. And these are the ones that I chose for my questionnaire. So this is a whole process of my thoughts. I started looking at the left, uh, at the semantic categories that I could find. And so starting from plants and foodstuffs, then natural phenomena, animals, liquids and mass, body parts. And on the right side, you can see the first arrows, grass and wheat as plants, star and cloud, horse and goat, water, and then eye. These were my first um, the first choice that I made was uh, for these lexemes. But then I had to decide which ones to keep and why. So grass, I kept it. Wheat, it was a bit more tricky. I, I shared a questionnaire, like um, a te I tested out a possible questionnaire and even not, 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 not even Cushitic speakers, like Italian speakers. And they still struggled into looking at these pictures and I will show you what I used for the questionnaire, but I show pictures to informants and they have to provide a form. Um, and the pictures for wheat were all confusing in a way. I would always get different responses from the ones that I would, ex uh, I thought I could expect. Then star was fine, cloud, it worked, horse, it worked, goat, uh, it was a bit more problematic because you have the difference between the terms female goat and male goat which is very interesting and I think I will work on it uh, in the future. Um, but I was not, um, I thought maybe it's not the best to uh, use this first pilot study and make it already more complex using some 
multiple uh, pictures for goats rather than for the other uh, like seams. So it will be good for, for later. Water, I kept it, I, I kept it. Then why did I decide actually to change my mind in the end? Because I discussed with my PI again and <clears throat> she said, okay, grass, it's fine. The pictures that I found were fine. Cloud, okay. Then we use cow instead of horse. Why? Simply because um, she already um, hired an illustrator last year who would um, draw the exact amount of animals that we would like in each picture so to elicit what we want. And so she wanted me to test out the drawings already, whereas all the others are uh, pictures, like photographs. And so this is why cow is included. Water, okay. And then instead of eye, uh, again, she wanted me to test out hand instead. But how did we get here? So these are some of the most common like, themes with singulatives that I found in my um, literature review so far over the past two years. So let's see uh, animates first. On the left, you can see everything related to human beings especially ethnonyms, which are the most common ones um, overall having singulatives in, in my sample. Then you have kinship terms, slave, person, man, and woman. On the right, you have animals such as cow, giraffe, lion, horse, goat, mosquito, and so on, many more. And why I decided not to include any of the animates for human beings in my study. This is just one example. For instance, if you uh, are to elicit a term for ethnonym, so you insert any ethnic group like Oromo, person, French, person, Italian, person, and so on. How do you rep represent it in a picture so that the informant will reply with Oromo person? It's very tricky. Uh, I mean, you could use flags, you could try to give, like, make them dress in a traditional costume, but it's still, well, first, it's not natural at all. And second, it's very, very difficult. So I decided just to avoid it altogether for now. Then we have some inanimates. <clears throat> uh, on the left, we have uh, body parts such as breast, ear, eye, finger, tooth, nostril, rib, and others. Uh, on the right, you have natural phenomena such as moon and sun, star, stone, fire, sun, and cloud. Um, just another example of something that is problematic to, to represent, it's sand, for instance. Um, because if I am to elicit one grain of sand, uh, I even try to take pictures myself with like putting a grain of sand on my, on my finger, but still, you might get the response of like, I don't know, finger, for instance, or anything else in the picture, just like this one would be hand or leaf or something else. And, uh, and the first um, picture would give you, could give you waves or some other material, maybe not sand. Some other inanimates, we have plant and plants and foodstuffs on the left, such as tree, grass, leaf, maize cob, wheat, sorghum and bread and others. Um, on the right you have liquids and mass such as beer, water, milk, mud and calabash. Why calabash is <laughs> with liquids? Simply because the, the times that I found calabash in different languages they were always referring these terms to um, the calabash that contain, contains, for, um, for instance, sour milk. So it was always meant to be with milk or some liquid, never referring to the calabash itself or in a way something to eat or the container itself. It was referring to the liquid. Um, but I decided not to use it anyways. <laughs> um, and here I decided also not to use beer because in this case we was referring to banana beer. Um, which would be difficult because this picture is of banana beer in a glass. Uh, but how many more responses I could get? 
a blue cup, uh, a person uh, holding a cup. Uh, I could get several things. And maybe it doesn't even look like beer. It might look like, I don't know, coffee with milk or something else. So it's quite tricky. And so in the end, these are the ones that I went for, grass, cloud, cow, water, and hand. And let's see them. These are screenshots from, from the questionnaire. Um, so first I asked them, well, first there are some uh, instructions, but here I asked them uh, to look at these pictures. So what do you see here? Describe it with one word and translate it. So I, I asked them to translate it into English or other languages, meta languages that they might know. So first write it in your Cushitic language and then in English, for instance. And the second part of the question is write a short sentence with the word you just wrote, then translate it to give it a context in a way. Um, so these are the winners, let's say. So these are the pictures that I used for grass. Of course, they are not perfect. And I had to uh, look for uh, pictures that are free to use online, or I took some pictures myself or uh, something like that. Mm. But here is one, possibly one. So I'm, I'm hoping to get something like a singulative here. Maybe not, we will see. Then we have, well, it, it, this could be both grass generic or uh, some of them, some items. And the last one should represent grass in general or a plurative. I actually don't know. So this is, these are possible interpretations for each picture. The same goes for cloud. So ideally one cloud, some clouds, and a lot of them, so many that you cannot count them. And the problem with cows, I already found some problems with the first speakers that uh, replied. Um, but this is the idea to get all of these, to, to make all of these drawings for each of the lexemes that are um, way more common, uh, not only in Cushitic, but cross-linguistically. And so this is one, two, but they are not allowed to reply with numbers. Uh, so I might expect a pocative if this language has one. A dual would be in Arabic, but we are not studying Arabic now. Um, and then we have many, a possible plurative, perhaps. And this might either get, I don't know, a collective, a mass or a plurative, it, it depends. So uh, we are just trying to understand what are the possible responses, what a speaker sees in these pictures and what is the actual use they make of uh, these number values. Then for water, since I had five pictures for cow, I had to reduce them, the pictures for some, someone else. So water only has two possible uh, situations in which the first one, I'm hoping to get water as a response. And the second one should be something like a drop of water. So possibly a singulative here. And hand, uh, this already is problematic as well, just like cow. Uh, but ideally, the first one would be a singulative. The second one might be a possible plurative or something in between. And the last one shows a lot of hand and also uh, belonging to different people, whereas the second one might still be uh, related to one person having two hands. And, and so maybe there's a different term for that. The problem is that someone got distracted with this uh, light. And so they replied light instead or something like that. Um, and so in the metadata, um, when I ask them which are the languages that they speak, if they speak any Cushitic language, I had to add this little note here. So if you speak Afan Oromo, so we go back to the mention that I made at the beginning. If you speak Afan Oromo, but do not speak any of the varieties listed below, please select Oromo Ada, and you will see it in a second, and type Afan Oromo, or the name of the language in the last box. Other. So this is the, the rest of the languages. So from here, from the second uh, table, you can see at the, to at the bottom, Oromo, Borana, Arsi, Guji, Oromifa, which are all possible names that I found for Borana, which is more known to linguists as Borana, but not only. 
Um, for instance, Oromifa is already debatable because just a couple of speakers recognize it as Borana, some others said, no, it doesn't mean anything to me, and so on. Then you have Oromo Harar, Oromo Orma, Raya, Wata, Wellega, and Ada. And so I was uh, hoping for them to um, check this box here. And then at the bottom, uh, here it's in Italian because I, I have it in Italian, but it's other for them. Um, here they can type the name of the language as they know it, whatever the language it might be, even for the other languages. Um, the problem is that Oromo, I had to separate it into these uh, six varieties and I will come back to this in a moment. Um, but this is the list of languages. So what do they see, uh, like the instruction that they see before filling out the questionnaire are these. Here is an example in Italian. You would use acoustic language, then translate it uh, into English. So what do you see here? The same question that you saw already. Describe it with one word and translate it. So I, I wrote automobili in Italian and cars in English as meta language. The second part is uh, write a short sentence with the word you just wrote, then translate it. Le automobili sono vecchie, the cars are old. And what not to do? So do not count the items. For example, do not write two cars. Do not forget the verb. For example, do not write all cars because I wanted a full sentence. And so write a full but short and simple sentence. For example, the cars are in the field. And then if, if the sentence you come up with uh, is not related to the context of the picture, then it, it doesn't really matter because as long as it's a full sentence with the word in question, it still works for me. So whatever you come up with, with these two cars, but you are not allowed to use two cars. Mm, results, well, I already saw a couple of results of them, but the possible outcomes that I was expecting. So, mm, the idea is that this questionnaire is going to be part of a semantic study using an onomasiological approach. So going, going from meaning and expecting a form, such as I have a concept here, I give them a concept, in this case, grass or some, or some items, something related to grass, whatever you see in this picture, this is the concept. In, in my mind, this is grass. Um, and so potentially I would get, for instance, from Dasanach, I could get ish, rust, a generic base term, the, the blue terms, for instance. Um, something I have no control over is the variation, such as uh, there are several factors for which um, I cannot um, go too much uh, deeper into it because all the speakers, all the informants that I will get, they have different repertoires. They speak uh, different varieties potentially. They have different levels of education. It depends if they spent a lot of time abroad or in their own country and so on. So there are so many um, factors that can vary. I have no control over this. Um, but what I can look at from this questionnaire, uh, I can uh, observe the number of values that they select. So what is the actual use that they would make of a base form, a singulative form, a plurative form, or a pocative form in terms of form, then I'm looking at the semantics. Um, and whatever happens, these are, in my mind, these are positive results, like find native speakers. So uh, going online and sending this questionnaire everywhere, uh, I'm hoping to find some, at least some speakers and, and possibly work with them in the future. In this way, I would also select the languages. So between these 31 languages, um, how many can I actually work with in the future or um, the other project that my PI is starting uh, right now after my PhD, um, whatever, whoever she can find, which are the, those languages? So we will see possibly three or four, not, not more but we are still happy with those. And then uh, whatever singulative data I can collect, it's already a win because um, there is not much data about singulatives in the literature or they are not described properly or they are confused with other features and so on. So 
whatever I can find, it's already um, a positive result. And then, of course, make mistakes to create better questionnaires for the stage two. So this is a pilot study. Whatever I, um, I did with this questionnaire, we will or they will improve it in the future based on my mistakes, of course. Some unexpected outcomes that I saw in the past two weeks, because the questionnaire has been online just for two weeks. The name of the languages. Well, I actually expected this one, but not so much. So, Oromo, uh, let me see how much time I have. Okay. Um, so I had to divide it into these six varieties. Uh, the first one, Orana, and the other terms is spoken in Kenya. The second one, Harar or Eastern Oromo, is spoken in Ethiopia, Eastern Oromia. Orma in Kenya, Raya, Northern Ethiopia, Wata in Kenya, Wellega, Western Ethiopia. So this is a map uh, from Wikipedia, but ideally it's from Ethnolog, but 2015. I, I don't know if they had a more recent one, but for now it's, it's fine. Just to show you, um, how spread is Oromo and its varieties. So I, I couldn't use Oromo as a whole. I couldn't say Afan Oromo. Why? Because in the literature um, that I could find, there is, for instance, a grammar of Raya, specifically Raya, not a grammar of Afan Oromo in general. It's Raya of Afan Oromo. Um, or for Orma or for Wata, which is here, at the bottom, you can see it here. It's a very small variety, but still they have different grammars and dictionaries and so on. So I wanted to see if they are worth being separated. Um, because in, so far in the literature, yes. And this is, these are the reasons why. So um, you can see here uh, for Borana, I found four different sources, which are the ones that I worked with a lot. For Harar, one source only. Orma, one. Raya, one. Wata, one. Well, I got two sources and just mentioned in one page or two pages of these sources. So it's already very, very uh, scarce, of course. And these are all the um, singulative markers that I could find per language in these sources. So you can see the orange ones are all masculine then these ones are not given, not, not, not available. The yellow ones are feminine um, markers. Most of them look alike because there is some sort of pattern like ch or sh or s for uh, the masculine marker, singulative marker, and t with e um, for um, the feminine marker. And then we also have this one, which is not given. I suppose it's a possible uh, feminine as well, but yeah, not given. Um, but then per language, we have some more information, such as in Harar, uh, these are called definite markers. So they have this function. Some other languages don't have this function. So I wanted to keep them separate because in my first paper on morphology, I had to separate them. Then we have uh, in Welega, we have one source that says that these are definite markers, cha, itcha, and itti. Uh, but Bragg also adds that t um, is uh, a diminutive, in particular a pejorative, when it's added to a, a masculine noun. So they have different functions, and this is what I wanted to look at. Like, is it worth to keep them separate, or in the end, all uh, speakers will give the same response because they want to belong in, in, to this bigger group as Afan or Omo. They don't want to be separated in different varieties, but in the sources, they are separate. So this is a problem that I'm already facing. And then some missing languages. Even one speaker just said, oh, but why didn't you include this language? And I said, well, it's not included because I'm, not, I'm looking at a specific feature and this language doesn't have it. But if you want to, blah, 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 just fill the questionnaire anyways and add it to the other um, box. Uh, but this is something, yes, that happened. And then political issues. Because in, in particular for Oromo and all this separation that I did, just based on the literature and nothing else, turned out to be a political issue because uh, speakers thought 
uh, that I was biased in a way, such as I was trying to mine their um, belonging to the Oromo or to the region Oromia and so on. But no, it's just a scientific uh, research. And I literally just show you why I chose the, these languages, just because they are separated in the literature. And then the problem of being a female researcher. Unfortunately, this is still a problem because I received private messages which are quite concerning. And so, of course, this, well, <laughs> this is a problem and it stays a problem. And something that I didn't realize, and I discussed it yesterday with Yvonne Trice, is that my name sounds uh, Amharic, but I'm Italian. <laughs> so uh, they probably, um, possibly, they thought that I was biased in a way, uh, and I had a political opinion or whatever opinion on the ethnic groups or the languages that they speak, but I don't. I'm Italian. I, I really don't understand anything about the deepest um, controversies that they're that they might have between groups. I, I cannot see them even. I want to understand if they explain to me that this is a problem, of course. And this is why I e emailed back everybody and I try to understand what's wrong, what I can fix with the questioner and the languages and so on. Um, but I'm not Ethiopian. I mean, my father is Ethiopian, but I grew up, I was born and I grew up in Italy. Um, so I really don't understand all of these issues, whereas maybe they just look at my name and they expect me to understand those or to be biased. And so in conclusion, I told you about my project, which is divided into three papers, morphology, now I'm working on semantics, and then other features of singulatives. The terminology that I used has to be divided into morphology and semantics. And the singulatives need to be looked at within grammatical number systems. Then I showed you the questionnaire, especially the behind the scenes and the lexemes or concepts and pictures selection and um, the results or positive and negative outcomes that I might get. Maybe negative outcomes are not so negative because I can still learn from these mistakes and make a better questioner in the future or be helpful uh, for someone else who wants to do something similar in the future and they can avoid the same mistakes they made. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. So we can start the question and answer section. Um, as always, you can either uh, write your question in the chat or you can raise your hand using the control panel in Zoom uh, and I will give you the turn. Uh, please remember that uh, these webinars are being recorded, so everything that you do uh, ask will be part of the recording and put on YouTube. Uh, pause. Um, I think I'll start with a question of my own. I really find it interesting. I, I collect data myself online, so it's always nice to see other people's projects and similar issues I think that maybe people run into. Um, so I think one of my main questions was, um, do you foresee any trouble maybe with having a, uh, only a written representation of the words that you're collecting? Because I don't know if everyone might know how to write their own variety or know how to deal with the sounds. Like how are you dealing with the data coming in? Like if they write an S, but maybe they wanted a C with like the circumflex or something like that. Like how, how do you deal with that dimension? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually, um, I'm expecting some variety in the way they write. Uh, we even try to uh, to choose between what if they write, they want to write in Fidel, like in a different alphabet. Um, well, that's a problem, of course, because maybe uh, the form that that's the format that I'm using with uh, Google Sheets is not um, proper for Fidel writing. Or uh, yes, they could potentially, but I didn't specify it um, simply because already the instructions for the questionnaire, I didn't show you the whole thing, but it's already quite long. And so uh, a lot of people might be discouraged already seeing like the first, the information sheet, it's already like a whole page and they get tired and they don't want to read it, of course. So they just skip the whole thing. Mm, but that would have been some more instructions, like something else to specify. Um, I think I, I wrote it in the information sheet anyways, like one short sentence, like 
write it as you know it it doesn't matter um but yeah that's a problem i really cannot solve it's like uh, among the variation issues that i cannot fix or um yeah <laughs> i don't have a solution for this especially right now even the problem of showing pictures to people of course this excludes all the people that cannot see and so it's a specific kind of elicitation and it has a lot of problems of course now, it was the easiest way for me to get a questionnaire online and to find speakers online but yeah that, that's a problem I, I don't have a solution if anyone has a solution for that yeah, the only thing that we do is record people, but yeah, that that um, puts more demands on the questionnaire, and I don't think that would, for example, be possible by uh, the Google questionnaire. So it's uh, it's a, a yeah, different the, dimension yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, and this is an anonymous questionnaire, and they don't get paid yet because mm -hmm. the paid section will be for the interviews instead. So in that in that phase, yes, we would uh, record them and so on in the second stage. So this was already let, just as a pilot study, just to see if any speakers re reply, how do they reply? Do we need to change the names of, of the languages? And so on. all of these meta issues, yes. Uh, and one final, but more the metadata. So um, do you also record the locations where speakers are from? Yes. Um, okay, great. Yeah, because yes, that yes, helps yes. usually even if they have either the same name for the variety, but there's variation or they have wildly different names, usually pinpointing where they actually learn the language really helps for us. At least. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. yes. Um, I, I even explained the whole thing in another talk, but today I wanted to focus on these new issues that I found about Oromo, which are like from last week. Uh, but yes, um, there's the whole section after the information sheet in which they can tell me uh, where they were born, where did they grow up, uh, which languages did they speak uh, in their household when growing up, and all these questions just to try to narrow down the actual variety they are speaking, despite the name might be different from. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Uh, then I see that Andrew Harvey raised his hand, so I'll ask him to unmute. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, uh, Rahel, for your um, talk. Uh, really uh, exciting to see the uh, progress of uh, your research. Um, and I really appreciate you sort of taking us behind the scenes into the actual administration of the questionnaire and to see uh, that you've been doing it in an iterative uh, manner. I think that's uh, I think that's really cool. And it's something that should be um, that should be uh, uh, copied. Um, <clears throat> for me, like, yeah, I completely I completely get like some of these issues that you're encountering in terms of like what like how do we get the forms, like the actual forms that we're looking for? The actual morphological forms. But then, yeah, and then this sort of larger question of like, okay, now that we have the forms, what exactly do they mean? And I know that for me, like, this is kind of an ongoing thing. With, with Gorwa, I, I was lucky that I could record these forms in an elicitation environment. But even now, I feel like, you know, I really want some natural speech data to back up uh, what the elicitation told me, especially on the semantics of these forms, you know, how do people use them? Where do they show up? Um, what are they meaning when they, when they use them? And, um, you know, I mean, since I finished my, my, my dissertation, uh, you know, I finished writing it in 2018. I mean, I'm still working on this process of trying to understand the semantics of, uh, these forms. So, um, for you in terms of your workflow now what are what are the next uh, what are the next steps so uh, can you hear me yes yeah okay um so the next steps well uh, now i'm quite discouraged as well <laughs> with the results that i got because um i was expecting a little bit more participation but of course i need to advertise the questionnaire again and more and more <laughs> and everywhere <laughs> But I just got nine uh, responses so far, like in two weeks, uh, despite all the people that told me, yes, sure, I'm going to fill it. Then I just got nine people taking 20 minutes of their day and filling it for free. Um, mm -hmm. And so now I'm quite thinking of 
yeah, maybe my, my actual second paper is not going to be about semantics because the, the responses that I got already, like I checked a couple of them, um, right. they are so different from one another, despite being the same language. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mainly have one language and then a couple of uh, more. Uh, and so it's going to be probably a methodological paper instead because, uh, yeah, I, I didn't get anything about semantics uh, other than what are the proper pictures that I should use for the next time? Because, for instance, I didn't expect to see that cows are problematic as well. I thought they would be the more recognizable animal, the easiest to, to determine and so on. But no, because last week uh, an Oromo speaker told me that to him, those cows look like they just uh, gave birth or that they are pregnant because of the shape that they have. And this is something that I really didn't notice at all. I mean, I didn't draw them, but my supervisor instructed this illustrator and told her exactly how to depict them. But she probably went for the basic kind of cow. And which one is that? The one that you see on advertisements for milk which are the ones that are very full. And that's something that if you don't have to do anything with cows in your life, in, a, in your daily life, you might not notice. Whereas this Oromo speaker, and he lives in a city, so not necessarily with cows, he still recognized that those cows in those drawings uh, need to get a different lexeme other than a generic cow which is a problem, of course. <laughs> but now it's too late to change the questionnaire. So of course I'm waiting for other speakers to see what they um, see in these cow pictures, if they see the same issue or not. Um, but yeah, probably I will discuss all of these problems, like meta problems in my second paper. And I'm already working on the third paper instead, like on, on the other possible features. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, uh, now I'm working on those two. And since this is my last year of PhD, uh, I'm also applying for funding, like to finish the PhD. And then I don't know what's going to be <laughs> my life. But <laughs> um, for now, I'm trying to fix these issues. Like uh, I probably I was a little bit more optimistic, not so much um, about this questionnaire. Um, but no, it's not going to be about semantics in the end because barely anyone replied in the proper way. Or even like, instead of clouds, they saw fog. And mm -hmm. fog is not a word that I would expect. Then I discussed with Yvonne Trice and she said that she noticed that for them, for some of them in English, fog and cloud are collectified. And so they would call each one of the, of the items that they can see in the pictures, they would call them either way, regardless. And so I didn't realize that fog was a problem with cloud. Cloud is the, I mean, to me, it's even simpler. So why would you go for a more difficult term like fog, something very specific? But yeah, <laughs> this is what I got. So probably I will discuss all of these problems in, in my papers. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Any well, suggestions? A lot of this kind of like a lot of this rhymes with some of the issues that I had even doing face to face elicitation. Um, so yeah, I can I can absolutely vouch for the fact that it's that it's difficult. And even with like, yeah, and with this specific, you know, sort of construction, this specific part of the grammar. It's very uh, complicated. And I saw on sort of giving some strong nods on the video when it came to like, looking for for speaker interest and getting uptake and things like that it's it's not it's not easy yeah, yeah I, i'll just join with that like it's uh, i've been involved in a crowdsourcing project and crowdsourcing is very nice but it's uh it means you have to put a lot of effort in and finding people and it's very complex so actually one of my questions i still had written down was how were you finding participants uh which i think you already have answered that so. <laughs> But are you going through local institutes maybe, or are you using social media or do you have a firm strategy? Yeah, so um, since the beginning of the PhD, I decided to join some social media. I wasn't on social media before, uh, precisely for this, like having this idea in mind to find speakers. Um, so like for over a year, I've 
or two years, I've been collecting speakers, let's say, like trying to contact them to, um, uh, to understand who might help me in the future uh, for, um, because my PI for this second stage of the project, she's going to hire research assistants in some of these languages. So we are even open to um, not only give money in exchange for a questionnaire, but to have actual research assistants working with us or with her. Um, so I was already uh, scattering like the internet for that. For that. And so I was um, contacting them on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and then, yes, and then some official mailing lists. Uh, and for that, some, some of my colleagues in Helsinki helped me. But also here in Lacan, of course, uh, they know a lot of speakers for certain languages. So they are also like sharing the questionnaire with like personally with some of, of the speakers that they know. Uh, and regardless, your personal uh, relationship with this, um, these speakers, they might still not feel it because again it's uh, it's for free and then it takes 20 minutes and it's long of course 20 minutes it's a lot in nowadays when you have everything is so quick you know everything needs to be in a couple of seconds and that's it uh, why on earth would they spend 20 minutes of their life filling a questionnaire of course it doesn't really make sense on the other hand i was again discussing with Yvonne tries this problem if you give compensation to everybody, even for a simple question like this, um, which which is anonymous, so you, that's another problem. Um, I couldn't like for the ethical uh, uh, reasons, like I couldn't make it uh, both things. So I had to keep it anonymous and not give compensation. Um, but if you give compensation, even, even for a simple thing like this on the internet, randomly, um, then you you raise the how do you say it? like the bar like every speaker every informant for like a specific region in in the world they might expect you wherever you are from so maybe you have a uni you are in a university in which you are not given funds funds for giving compensation and you might be looking for speakers but they might expect you to pay them a certain amount because they are used to that. And this is also why I contacted Andrew uh, some time uh, back because I was trying to understand what's the possible sum, like the amount of money that you should pay them for what they give you. Um, and so probably I will use that advice for the interview uh, side because then you spend hours together and you work together with a couple of speakers per language and so on. Um, but for now, I had to keep it like this. And of course, why would you, like, would you, like, informant, whoever you might be, fill this questionnaire? You have no reason. Other than that I've been contacting you personally on LinkedIn. And so you replied. Some of them just replied to me, like, they kept my contact in uh, on social media just because I'm a woman. Then they don't, mm, how do you say, uh, they don't take me seriously as a researcher. And so they don't fill the questionnaire, but they keep messaging me. Mm -hmm. Even though my contact was only like already like from the beginning, it was about I'm working on this, blah, blah. In the future, I will share a questionnaire already two years ago. So that's another problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, it's definitely problematic. It's also, I mean, we've also had bad results when it comes to social media because, yeah, you can post it somewhere. People get excited, but then they don't do it. In our experience, it, it always works best if you have someone local, because again, you need to have a personal connection and not necessarily you as a researcher need personal connection. You need a personal connection with the person asking to do it. Mm -hmm. So if you have a local person in, for example, a cultural institute, a library, a teacher, anything like that, who gets excited about this project and he sees the value or she sees the value, uh, and you have someone promoting this, then you can really get good responses. But yeah, just anonymous online, particularly if they don't know you, also for us, it was very, very difficult. Um, yeah, I had one yeah. contact actually like that. I had uh, one uh, speaker who is also a, who was also a scholar in the consul region. And at the beginning, I was meant to do fieldwork with him, like paying him as a as an assistant, and then he would find the speakers for consul. Then what what happened? Well, basically, he never replied to my emails, uh, and like in over the past year or so, 
Why? Because he is now into politics. So he changed, like, I think he's in the parliament or something. Like, he completely <laughs> changed his job. So, of course, he's not interested in, in helping me anymore. But he was my contact. <laughs> he was a professor that I had in Ethiopia, like a local again. Um, but then, yeah, th this changed. And of course, this was also unexpected because now I have to find someone else. Um, and this is what I'm trying to do also here in Lacan because um, this is a research center uh, with a lot of Africanists, which is something very I'm very grateful for because in Helsinki, I don't have any Africanists for East Africa. Uh, and so now I'm trying to get their contacts and understand if I can work with them and so on. But of course, this question already, as you can see, is already so flawed, like you notice already all these problems with the pictures and so on, then maybe it's fine for now. And then we will improve all the strategies for the future as well, like as uh, with sharing and so on. Yeah, but even like another problem was in the advertisement that I used, like I, I used, um, I made on Canva, um, this advertisement, and then I had to add the languages on the second page. And the names of the languages, since I had to keep it short in one page, a short page that you can see on your, on your, on your smartphone, it couldn't be the whole full list of possible names per language. And they literally got offended. They emailed me back or they sent me messages back saying, but why on earth did you dare to write this name of this language? Because I didn't have room. That was it. But if you keep it short, then you don't make them happy. If you keep it long, then they don't just don't read it because it's too long, it's boring. So I understand their point of view, of course, but this was another issue, yeah. Yeah, it is complex how to do this communication properly. As you say, there's always the political specter. Also here, the minority languages, how you refer to them, like whether it's a language, it's a dialect, how you name them. Um, yeah, they're all, important issues to consider, but also very highly complex. And the more languages you have, the, the more complex it gets. And especially with 34, I can't even imagine, especially spread across three different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't envy you the task. <laughs> Which is why I think it's so valuable for you to be thinking about methods and methodology. I mean, uh, I, I'd very much look forward to a reflection on, on your experience in, in, yeah, in a paper or something like that. It's uh, this has been really valuable in and of itself, just sort of, uh, I know that we've had discussions in the past about um, in-person versus remote uh, data collection field work. And I think it's, and I think it's, it's more relevant than ever. And uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's a really useful uh, discussion to be having. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually for field work methods, um, I was so happy when, when I found the podcast you were in twice, I think. Uh, because you really went into the behind the scenes again, which is something that you don't find easily uh, either on the internet or in the uh, academic literature. Like what actually happened? Why did you go with this uh, option instead of the other and so on? So maybe, yes, I, I will be happy with even just sharing my mistakes and hoping for someone else to avoid them in the future. And of course, being like doing fieldwork in person would be the best option. I just couldn't. At that point, uh, let's see what happens if I get postdoc and then blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Are there any other comments or questions? So far, the chat is empty. Uh, I don't see any raised hand. I think not. So I think we can uh, uh, round up our discussion section for today. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley Bibliography. Um, looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 2nd of November, and will be presented by Stephen Goldstein. And it is titled, A Deep Time Record of Farming, Migration, and Food Security at Kakapel Rock Shelter in Western Tanzania. Uh, also, I'd like to add a note for those who might uh, it might apply to. Uh, we're very soon starting daylight saving time, so keep that in mind for the next webinar. So it might be an hour earlier than what you're used to now. Um, yeah, with that, I would like to thank Rael again for her presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.